All right, live from the Student Center at Hofstra University in Hempstead, New York. This is John Rothstein on 1050 ESPN New York, taking you with a special look at one of the on-campus facilities in the tri-state area in a jam-packed show for you today. We will hear from Pride head coach Tom Pecora coming up about 10.20, as well as the straw that stirs the drink here in central Long Island, Speedy Claxton, the guy who got this whole thing going about 10 years ago when he played under Coach Pecora and Jay Wright when the Pride lost to the Oklahoma State Cowboys in the 2000 NCAA tournament. But before we make the transition to college basketball, before we take that sort of a step, we have to talk about what happened yesterday because yesterday, for a lot of reasons, was the defining moment the seminal moment in the rebuilding process for the New York Knicks. And there's so much intrigue. There is so much sizzle, so to speak, about what's at hand, what's at the forefront, what the future might bring. But the bottom line in sports is that if you don't have the ability to bring marquee talent in through a draft, and in the draft the NBA has been the backbone of any sort of success, because let's go through the elite teams in the league right now. The Lakers drafted Kobe Bryant and Andrew Bynum. The Cleveland Cavaliers drafted LeBron James. The Orlando Magic drafted Dwight Howard. And you better believe the reason why Madison Square Garden had a renaissance in the 1990s is because the Knicks had the luxury of drafting Patrick Ewing in 1985. But sometimes you're not afforded those opportunities. Sometimes those opportunities don't come across your desk. And sometimes you have to be a little bit creative. And that's what Donnie Walsh has done. And it's high risk and high reward for a lot of different reasons. Because let's take a look at the inventory. The future has been mortgaged. There is no future beyond 2011. Because if you want to talk about winning in the NBA, you need a franchise-type talent, not a top-tier talent, a franchise-type talent to change things from day one. And if you don't have that, you have to do what Pat Riley did before he traded for Shaquille O'Neal about five or six years ago. You have to stockpile as many assets as possible and try and pawn those off for a marquee star. It's the same thing the Boston Celtics did to get Kevin Garnett. Now the Knicks, they've dealt in their assets and they haven't got that much in return. They have a broken down star in Tracy McGrady who I still believe will find a way to revitalize his career at Madison Square Garden. But you have an awful lot of salary cap space. And the bottom line at the end of the day is it's sp in sports, you want to have the opportunity to be at bat. You want to have the opportunity to have a chance to dance that special dance with the type of premier talent that can change a franchise. And we're not talking about somebody that can just change a franchise. We are talking about players right now that can once again get Madison Square Garden going as the world's most famous arena, as the hottest ticket in professional sports. But will that happen? And who's on the Knicks list? Because you better be prepared for a lot of different scenarios. And one thing we all have to remember, and it's pretty, pretty important, New York is not the only city in the world. It is not the only team in the NBA that has put themselves in a position to retain or obtain marquee free agents this summer. Who else is on the list? And what will the response be when the Knicks go after these free agents. We're going to break that all down when we return. This is John Rothstein on 1050 ESPN New York, coming to you live from Hofstra University. Pride head coach Tom Facor coming up at 1020. Speedy Claxton about 1040. More on the Knicks when we return. John Rothstein on 1050 ESPN New York. All right, John Rothstein back here on 1050 ESPN New York, coming to you live from Hofstra University as 1050 hits the road on this 2010 college tour. Going to talk to Pride head coach Tom Pecora coming up about 1020. Speedy Claxton, the guy that started this whole thing off here at Hempstead, Long Island, about 10 years ago. He's coming up at 1040. We'll continue to get into some college basketball later in the program as well. But right now we start with the Knicks, who enter right now a new chapter, a new page because right now 
there's two sides, and I want to get to the side that's going to start with the players that they acquired yesterday at the trade deadline. Right now, if you're Donnie Walsh, all you're doing for the next 30 or 31 games is taking inventory. You want to see what you have in Tracy McGrady because it's pretty, pretty clear that if you are going to put a marquee-type talent in New York City, you're going to want to have a supporting cast. You're going to want to have people that can contribute around them, and we've seen that throughout the course of the NBA. And Tracy McGrady is a player who has definitely hit the downward spiral in his career. But if you don't believe that there's still 60 or 70 percent out of what we saw three or four years ago, I think you're crazy. And sometimes in sports, it takes a new location. It takes a new address to revitalize and rejuvenate a player. And I think you're going to see that. You want to talk about places to be? The Garden, usually when their home team is 19 and 34, is not a hot ticket. But tomorrow night, you have the Oklahoma City Thunder with Durant, with Westbrook, with James Harden taking on the new look Knicks, McGrady, Eddie House. It's going to be an interesting, interesting situation. And who's on the horizon after that? Who is on the list this summer? We start with LeBron James. And we've dissected, digested, and offered plenty of analysis, analysis on this the last couple of months. And we will do more tonight on 1050 from 10 to 12 when I'm hosting on Post Game Live. So please tune into that and give me a call at 1-800-919-ESPN. But... What I want to talk about LeBron James, and I think it's something that people are really, really dismissing. A lot of talk yesterday was about the cap space that the Knicks cleared and all that went into that. People are really losing sight of the fact that the Cavs put in place a marquee wingman next to LeBron two days ago when they acquired Anton Jameson. And I've talked to different people around the league, and a lot of people are in the belief that Anton Jamison is a better fit for the way Cleveland plays versus somebody like Amari Stoudemire. Because when you look at LeBron, the number one thing he needs around him is floor spacing and people that can make shots. Guys like Mo Williams, guys like Daniel Gibson. And if you had a Stoudemire and a Shaq in the pivot, that would inhibit LeBron's ability to get to the rim. Remember, in 2007, when the Cavs went to the NBA Finals, the reason why they were so successful against the Pistons in the Eastern Conference Finals was because Daniel Gibson played so well. Jamison is going to be a seamless transition. You can't run plays for him. He's a great guy in the locker room. And now you've got to think, if you have a Jamison and a Mo Williams in place, it's going to be pretty, pretty difficult to see LeBron James giving that up and coming to New York City. Now, with that said, Cavs obviously have to get to a certain threshold before it's safe to see them go in a different direction with LeBron. Have to make the conference finals, have to make the finals, or have to win the championship. But if it's any of those three, I find it really hard to believe that LeBron James is going to relocate and leave his hometown after he makes that type of a run in the NBA playoffs. So you go down the list, and you say who's left, and you say who might be on the horizon. The next person on the list, people go from the Grand Slam to the home run, they think about Dwayne Wade. Dwayne Wade's not going to leave South Beach. He's not going to leave South Beach. And if he ever entertained the notion of leaving South Beach, he would go home to Chicago. And Chicago is a team, and we've talked about it a lot on the radio station, that is really a hidden gem and a sleeping giant in this entire free agent process. Now, why do you say that? People, and we're guilty of it because we live in New York, we live in the tri-state area, we all see what New York has to offer. But I'll tell you this, Chicago is a step below living in New York. And if you have the talent that the Bulls have, if you have an anchor in the backcourt like Derrick Rose, if you have a dynamite, dynamite frontcourt of young players like Lou Aldang, like Joe Kim Noah, what's a more attractive situation? So keep that in mind. And that's a direct transition to the next guy on the list, and that's Chris Bosh. Now, Chris Bosh, for people you talk to, is always somebody who would be comfortable hanging out staying back in the limelight, being a complimentary piece. And I've been told by people around the NBA that it is his plan to go sign with the Miami Heat and play with Dwayne Wade. If he can be in that type of a situation, he can be in Miami, he can play with Wade, he can play with Beasley. You have the makings of a pretty special team. But the Bulls have made it clear that they have cleared cap space just as the, as the Knicks have, and they have been put in a position to either add a dynamite, dynamite player in the backcourt with, Dwayne, with Derrick Rose or upgrade their front court by going after somebody like Chris Bosh. So it's not going to be a total two-horse race right now between the Knicks and the teams that currently have these players. There's a lot of other suitors involved. 
And the next guy down the list, and the guy that I think people are really looking at as the backup plan, the ace in the hole, is Joe Johnson from the Atlanta Hawks. And I'll tell you something. When you think about teams that have been rising in the NBA, getting better year in, year out, there has been no team that has continued to improve steadily the last couple of years than the Atlanta Hawks. Two years ago, they win 37 games. They kind of sneak into the NBA playoffs. All of a sudden, they're going tit for tat, mano a mano, with the Boston Celtics in the first round of the NBA playoffs. The Celtics needed game seven to beat the Hawks. And then last year, they took the next step. They went to the second round of the playoffs. They got their clocks cleaned by the Cavs, but it didn't matter. And if you're Joe Johnson, and for people who have talked to Joe Johnson, even though he had a lot of autonomy under Mike D'Antoni, even though he kind of got his career going by that one season in Phoenix, the first season in which the Suns were able to win 60-plus games, he's a Southern guy. He's an Atlanta guy. And he understands, I think, all the pieces that are in place with the Atlanta Hawks right now. So it's an uphill battle. I don't want people to think that Joe Johnson is just somebody that's going to fall into the Knicks' lap. That is not a priority, and that is not a possibility. Hawks right now have an interesting, interesting road ahead of them for a lot of different reasons. When you look at the chemical makeup of the Eastern Conference, Cleveland separated themselves as the team to beat. But Boston is starting to look and reflect their birth certificates. Kevin Garnett's not moving as well. Ray Allen's not moving as well. Pierce isn't as fluid as he once was. And if you think that, and you also take into consideration that the Orlando Magic, even though they're 18 or 19 games over 500, don't have the same bounce and don't have the same matchup problems as they caused last year when they went to the NBA Finals, probably don't have the capabilities of beating the Cavaliers. The Hawks then I think have a legitimate shot because they're right there with the Magic in terms of record-wise to sneak into the Conference Finals. Would Joe Johnson leave that type of a group of Horford, of Josh Smith, of Jamal Crawford, of, of, of Marvin Williams to come to the Knicks? That's a tough sell. And that's where this gets really, really dicey. Because I open by saying that this is a high-risk, high-reward situation for the Knicks, and that's what it is. Because there's no guarantee that you're going to get a signature by any of these marquee free agents come July 1st. And there's different theories about do you give up draft picks? Do you mortgage the future? If you've been a Knicks fan the last couple years, you see what not protecting picks in the NBA draft does. It causes bedlam if you're a fan. If the Knicks had protected some of the picks that they made in that Eddie Curry trade, they would have had a chance to draft a LaMarcus Aldridge or draft a Joe Kim Noah. Instead, those picks went to Chicago. And it's amazing, when you draft well and you create a baseline for your franchise, it gives you an ability to move forward quicker. And I'll give you a perfect example. The Sacramento Kings, the team that embarrassed the Knicks last week in the game before the All-Star break. Just look at their team and think about all that it comes down to is drafting well. They have a stud in Tariq Evans who will be a perennial all-star year in and year out in this league. They also have a guy from Ryder who Hofstra will play here tomorrow as part of the Bracket Buster game in Jason Thompson that looks like a legitimate, legitimate NBA center, almost like a younger Bill Cartwright. They also have Omri Caspi, who's a nice player, rotation player, and they also have Dante Green, the kid who spent one year at Syracuse. That's what drafting well does for you. It creates a baseline. And now the Knicks have put themselves in a position where that's not an avenue for them to rebuild anymore. That's not a possibility. So in terms of this summer and the summer after this in 2011, you need more key talent. But we just dissected, digested, and went through the top four names on the list, and I gave you perfect reasons why all those four players, LeBron, Bosch, Wade, Joe Johnson, I'd say have a less than 50% chance of coming to New York. For more on the Knicks, for more on the summer of 2010, I will be back on 1050 tonight from 10 o'clock to 12 midnight. John Andres, longtime Knicks radio color analyst, will join me at 1025. Frank Isola from the New York Daily News coming up at 1110. And speaking of Italians, we got one coming up next. The head coach of the Pride, Tom Pacora, said to Hop along board, Speedy Claxton as well. John Rothstein here live at Hofstra on 1050 ESPN New York. Oh, Michael K., no way! It's me, Glenn, long-time listener. <laughs> hey, hey, what are you doing? Nah, come on, we're best buds. We need our own handshake, right? We'll go, and then bro hug into the bro bot. I am a robot, and then boom, make it explode!
Oh, my card. It's okay. It's okay. Don't worry. I get it back. All right? What's your pin? Come on. Seriously. What's your pin? The Michael K. Show. A new year, a new start time. Weekdays at 2 p.m., 1050 ESPN, New York. All right, back on the campus of Hofstra University, John Rothstein here on 1050 ESPN New York as we continue to get going and try to get February rolling into March because that's the best time of year, and our next guest knows about that, Hofstra head coach Tom Pacor. Coach, I didn't know you were up at 10 o'clock. Oh, I've been up for hours and hours. Coaches don't sleep. No, I know they don't sleep, but, I mean, let's talk about what's going on here right now. It seems like the chemistry is finally clicking. You guys have won three in a row. Any difference in the last three games compared to what you saw prior to that point? Yeah, well, we've won actually six of our last seven, and it's just got to do with us being healthy. You know, there was a stretch there in January. We had a real tough uh, schedule, you know, the way the league schedule played out. A lot of games on the road and playing the upper echelon of the conference. But we were dressing seven guys, and a couple of those guys were a little dinged up. So we were finally able to get ourselves healthy, and, and uh, we got on a bit of a roll a few weeks ago, and uh, we've been lucky enough to continue to play well in the month of February. Anytime you have a great player, like you've had a lot of here at Hofstra, the big thing you want to put next to him is a wingman, a complimentary piece. When you think of Charles Jenkins and this team, is he on an island by himself, or do you see a secondary piece coming to the forefront? Well, not anymore. I think early in the season, that was the big question mark. Who was going to be the person to step up with Charles uh, nine in and nine out? And, I think right now we've done it by committee, and, and, and that's been even better because over the last uh, month or so, we've had a number of guys averaging double-figure points. Greg Washington, a junior forward for us, has done a very good job in, in that sense. Chaz Williams, a freshman point guard mm -hmm. as well. And then maybe the biggest uh, thing for us is our two seniors have started to play well. Mike Zabo, a starting center for us from Hungary uh, over in Europe, has is, is really uh, played well the last month. And uh, Cornelius Vines, a senior guard from Syracuse, who I was kidding around with uh, maybe 10 days ago. I looked at his final stats from last year, and he had 72 three-pointers. And to that point he, uh, in the season this year, he only had 32. So I said, you owe us 40. <laughs> and the next game he had seven. And the game after that, he's had five. So I hope he took me literally, and he's going to continue to shoot the ball on that pace. But when he does that, it takes a great deal of pressure off of Charles. And the great thing about Charles is he'll make plays to win games, not just make shots to win games. And that's been... We've been very lucky here, you know, from, uh, from way back when and your next guest who's going to join you, Speedy Claxton, who's the greatest player to, to ever play at this university. Even though he was so dominant, he would dominate the game in so many different ways and fill up a stat sheet. And we've always searched for guards that could do that. And then, you know, we followed that with Norman Richardson and then Jason Hernandez and, and uh, Carlos Rivera and Lawrence Stokes and Rick Apodaca. So we had guys who could not only score, but... It, you know, tally assists, rebound the basketball, guard people, and Charles Jenkins falls right into that mold. When you think of Charles Jenkins, if there was one NBA or college player, past or present, that you could compare him to, who would it be? Uh, I'm showing my age, you know, but probably <laughs> like Mitch Richmond, you know, uh -huh. uh, a little undersized Mitch Richmond or maybe a little bit bigger Timmy Hardaway, you know, just because of his physical size. Uh, one of the officials in our league, Gene Sterator, uh, is also an NFL official. And before the game, he said to me, he's going to be a pro, but it's going to be as a safety in the NFL, <laughs> uh, not in the NBA because he's such a physical specimen. But, uh, you know, he, he's really uh, – his game continues to grow and he becomes better and better every time he steps on the floor. Hofstra head coach Tom Pacor joining John Rothstein here on 1050 ESPN New York as the Pride getting ready for a second-half surge. Now, you're 8-8 eight and eight right now in the conference. What is the separation between where you are and the top right now? How close are the teams from the middle to the top? Uh, well, it's about four games. I think we're locked in for the seven spot, and, and you know we could tie uh, two teams, but uh, with tiebreakers and all of that, we would end up being seven, which means we'll play at six o'clock on Friday night in our conference tournament down in Richmond. Uh, but it is, uh, a couple teams got extension early on, but now the pack is starting to, to come on back together with it. Uh, you know, there's a few teams at the bottom, but the, but the good thing about the CAA, and I think this is what you look at when you see good conferences, is even teams that are at the bottom are playing very competitive games. Mm -hmm. So teams at the bottom have upset teams at the top of the league over the last couple of weeks. So there's no ninths off. Uh, there are other conferences, and I've been in some where you can circle games and say, we're going to get this one, we're going to get that one. And the CAA is not one of those conferences, man. You look at games and you're just like, all right, we're going to have our hands full there. And here, and here. So there's no nights off till April. When you think of this conference right now in terms of who's the best team, you've played everybody right now, who stands out? Yeah, Northeastern and, uh, and Old Dominion. I think right now are the two teams playing at the highest level. 
Uh, and I, right now I believe they're both tied for first place. Northeastern will win the tiebreaker. One of the other issues is our conference, because of its size, we don't play everyone twice, so we play an unbalanced schedule. So you can get into, right. you know, you only play a team once, but you play them on the road, and they won at their place, and now you lose a championship because of it. I'm not sure how that dynamic plays out quite yet, and obviously we have a few games left in the league, but uh, those two teams right now are playing at the highest level. Now you mentioned Old Dominion, who had a win earlier this season at Georgetown. So yes. that shows you how good they are. Your impressions of Gerald Lee, the best player? Yeah, Gerald Lee is tough. He's our league's Tim Duncan. You know, big, uh -huh. very skilled, at about 6'10", uh, can, can hurt you from the outside and inside, and uh, really a balanced scorer and a great leader for them as well. So I think he's somebody who, uh, you know, a lot of the NBA teams have great interest in. And one thing people need to recognize when we talk about this league, you look up and down, players on, in this league can play anywhere in the country. You guys have Jenkins. I mean, Cam Long and Pearson from George Mason are very talented players. And you would know this better than I, but the kid Larry Sanders from VCU, I know a lot of NBA scouts have him on their radar. Oh, yeah. When they came in here, and uh, there must have been 15 uh, NBA guys here looking at both Charles and Larry. And, uh, you know, Matt Janning up at, at Northeastern. Everybody's got one, you yeah. know, for the most part. And, uh, and that's what good conferences do. So there's a lot of talent. Now, I saw your team early in the season. They were both losses, but I saw you against Connecticut. You I bring that up. Well, I'm trying to get to my next one. I saw you against Connecticut, and I saw you against St. John's. Right. And that you could tell in both games that there's flashes there that you can play with anybody in the country. How do you take the spurts you had in those games, plus what you've done recently, and combine it together to make sure your best basketball is being played down the stretch? Well, I think it's you know maturity. That comes with, uh, with, with time, and obviously I just did our, our practice schedule for today. And today's our 72nd practice of the year. So as you go through all of those practices, each day our goal is just to get a little bit better and better. And if you stay on task with that, you can get better. You know, UConn was a, a great opportunity for us to go up there. Having played at Kansas a few nights before, mm -hmm. I think really prepared us to go into UConn and not to be rattled by the atmosphere. And, you know, we had a tie game with a minute to go. And, uh, you know. And stories you play eight on five. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that. And then Dyson made a shot. And. And then we had a foul at the end. I think the separation ended up being eight or nine points, but it was, a, it was a tie game with a minute to go. And then, you know, at the Garden, we had beaten St. John's the last four times we played them. And, uh, you know, we basically thought we were going to find a way to win that basketball game, and we just went ice cold down the stretch, and, and they found a couple, uh, you know, baskets as, uh, as the game went on near the end there. And we weren't able to pull those two Big East wins out, and those are important for you, like you said, with, with Old Dominion getting – uh, the Georgetown went early. When the committee sits down, they're going to look at teams, especially mid-major teams, and they're going to say, well, all right, they have 23 wins. They have 24 wins. Right. Where are their quality out-of-conference wins? Right. And if you're lacking those, all of a sudden you go to the bottom of that pack of mid-major teams. And it's concerning to all of us in mid-major basketball that uh, each year the committee has taken fewer and fewer at-large mid-major teams. Last year I think there were five or six. Uh, so uh, that number has, has gone down over the last six years, even though there's been some great success in the tournament by mid-major programs. Oscar head coach Tom Pacora joining John Rothstein here on 1050 ESPN New York as we set the stage for tomorrow's game against Ryder and also a stretch run for the Pride moving in to March. Your team, since you've been here, have always had great guards. But I think a spark to them playing better is your ability to turn your opponents over. The last three games, you've turned your opponent over in double figures. How big is that to start your transition game? It's huge. I mean, everything is about defense and rebounding. Uh, you know, that's what I was weaned on. And, and, you know, offensively, I don't overcoach them. I just talk to them about getting good spacing. And, and then I let them make plays. I think you have to have freedom offensively. But defensively, you've got to have a football mentality. And rebounding the basketball, obviously you do. And when you can turn people over, it can lead to some easy baskets. And I think that's why if you look at the, uh, the points per game we're averaging over the second half of the season compared to the first half, it's up a bunch because we've found our ability and we've gotten better at our rotations and, and our ability, as we call them, blitzes. We use a lot of football terms on our defense <laughs> for obvious reasons, you know, to get, to get them thinking more aggressively. But all of our blitz packages, uh, they finally figure out where they need to be on the floor when those things take place. And and we're a little bit more aggressive in it. Early in the year, we were fouling a lot of people in those double teams. Later in the year, you kind of figure things out, you know. So, uh, and we've had five freshmen, you know. We have five freshmen and five veterans. So I kidded around and said we play bipolar basketball. <laughs> you know, uh, we can play like a bunch of freshmen for 10 minutes, and then we can play like a bunch of veterans for 10. But the veteran mindset has kind of taken over uh, lately. And, you know, we've gotten great support here. The crowds have been out. Obviously, our, our student base has been uh, great on campus. And, and it makes for a good home court uh, advantage, and that's big in our conference too because you go on the road and 
you know, you're playing against packed houses just about every night. And there's one thing I want to get into with you, which has been an issue throughout college basketball, and I know you definitely have an opinion on it. expanding the NCAA tournament. Right. It's something that I think everybody has had a different spin on. When you hear of this as somebody who really, let's face it, was kind of, you know, I don't trying say, to find the right I'm point. trying to find the right word right now. Taking away an opportunity you should have had yes, in 2006. Without a doubt. If you had to put that aside first, right. if that never happened to you, what would your reaction be to expanding the tournament? Well, I think it would be the same. And, and the reason being, when, when the tournament was expanded to 64 teams, there were 290 Division I teams. So almost 24% of Division I programs were playing in the postseason. Well, now that there's 349, I think, Division I teams. Uh, so obviously that number's down to about 18 or 19 percent. So I think you need to get it back up around 24 percent. That would make sense. And getting it to 96 would do that. But I'm also, I understand and been doing this long enough to realize it's all driven by television. Mm -hmm. If uh, CBS or ESPN or whoever the powers that be sign off on it and say this is how we want that tournament to be played out, then it'll move in that direction. And I think it's a tremendous product. Uh, right now, I think by expanding it can become even more of a product. And I think that's because you're extending a, a, a maybe another weekend of college basketball. And, and I think that's a good thing. I think the, uh, the country obviously relishes it. I think uh, it'll give a few more mid-major teams an opportunity. I still think the lion's share of those extra bids will go to BCS conference schools. But uh, I think it's good. It, it's time for a change. You worked at UNLV, a, you know, a team that plays in a big conference. You also, I know, have a lot of friends in bigger conferences. From their perspective, even though they beat every, everybody up, how much would it take away from those competitive in-season games and take some of the air out of that? I don't think it would at all. But when I talk to them, you know, we don't talk. Uh, when I'm talking to Jay down in Villanova, we don't talk about, are you getting in the tournament? He's playing for seeding. Right. And every night, like last night, I watched Georgetown and, and Syracuse, and that's a huge game. Now, they both know they're going to be in the NCAA tournament. It's a matter of them playing for seeding. So when you're at that level, you're just trying to get a higher seed so you can advance in the tournament and get through that first weekend. So every game becomes very, very important, and, and I don't think it will have any effect in that sense. I, I think what will happen is they probably will seed going into the tournament, and then they might make that first weekend, uh, you know, almost like a play-in type thing. But... Uh, whatever format they come up with, I think it will be very competitive. I know it will be, and, and I think it will be a good, uh, good thing for college basketball. Does it feel like you've been here 16 years? It feels like I've been here 36 <laughs> years. When we lose and when I win, it, it feels like uh, I, I just got here yesterday. But uh, Spahofsky is a special place. I've, I go into my 16th uh, year, my ninth year as the head coach here, and uh, it is amazing. I remember being, uh, you know, walking through this student center the first time, and just looking around at this place and saying, wow, this, this is a diamond in the rough. And, and Jay and I walked around this campus, and I, I said, you know, we can win here. And obviously that's been the case. We've had a great run here. Now, I know you've had some opportunities in other places, but you've been very opinionated and outspoken about talking how much it means to be in New York and right. to do this in New York. Mm -hmm. So why sometimes does that outweigh other opportunities? Well, you know, I think you have to be careful in anything you do in life. You know, sometimes you can be blind with ambition, and you, can, and you forget the impact it's not only going to have on you, but it's going to have on others, you know, your staff, your family, obviously, uh, you know, the qual your quality of life, you know. Uh, I left New York. You know, I went to Vegas, and I went to Loyola Marymount in California. I hated them both, both places for the most part. I didn't hate them. I just wasn't – I was a fish out of water. I'm an East Coast guy and more so a New Yorker. So, I mean, my quality of life here is tremendous. The thing in, in recruiting that gets to people all the time in college athletics is guys always say, you know, I, the recruiting's wearing me down. Well, here, you know, they say, we're going to practice at noon. I'll be done by 2. I'm going to go to a practice in Queens at 3. I'm going to go to a game in the Bronx at 7. And I'm going to be home in my own house at, uh, at 11. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it, and I'm going to visit friends. The people I'm recruiting young guys from are either, you know, older coaches who knew me as a kid. Right. My own peers, or as I get older, guys I coached against or coached. So it's, it's a much different dynamic, the recruiting part of it. And it's the greatest city in the world. I mean, people come from all over the world to get to New York. Right. It amazes me when young guys say, Coach, I want to leave New York, go somewhere else to college. I'm just like, dude, everybody in the world wants to come here. Why would you want to leave? And uh, it's sad, but so many of them that do that come back when they're done playing, whether it's in Europe or in the NBA a few years later, and they, and they sit down and they say, hey, coach, can you help me get a job in New York? Right. You know, and of course we do, but, you know, it's, it's the dynamic of the whole thing. This is a special place. All right. Well, I want to say this because I'm telling the truth right now. When you get into the media, people tell you, probably similar to coaching, how your fandom kind of dissipates. 
because you're really not rooting for sports anymore because you've got so much other stuff to worry about. You have to be objective, but you make it really easy to root for Hofstra. Ah, see that? We found another fan here. Give that's him a right. hand. That's right. So good luck tomorrow. Great seeing All right, you, man. John, thank All right, you so that's much. Uh, Hofstra head coach Tom Pacor, Speedy Claxton coming up. John Rothstein here on 1050 ESPN New York. It's me, Kyle. Come on, I listen to your show every day. Yeah, how you doing, man? I'm so good, actually. In fact, it says I probably need a kidney transplant. Oh, well, at least you only need one, right? You really do that for me? You give me a kidney? What? Oh, God! You give and you give and you give! <laughs> Mike and Mike in the morning on the official radio home of the Knicks. 1050 ESPN, New York. All right, John Rothstein back here at Hofstra University on 1050 ESPN New York as we continue our campus tour. Now here with the man who started the whole thing, the guy who really put Hofstra basketball on the map, former NBA star, Mr. Speedy Claxton. Speedy, great to have you aboard. Thanks for having me. So great how, to be back. I'm sure it's good to be back. Does it seem like 10 years ago that you were in the NCAA tournament here? <laughs> nah, it seems it's much longer than that, but uh, I guess time flies. Time definitely does fly. Now, Coach Pacor always tells the story that when he got here with Coach Wright and they started recruiting, nobody knew what Hofstra was. He used to get on the phone and say H-O-F-S-T-R-A. <laughs> so I'm just curious, with the recruiting process with Coach Pacor and Coach Wright, how did that all come about and how early did it come about? I mean, if I didn't live right down the block, I wouldn't have probably knew uh, what the school was neither. But, uh, you know, they was, they was great guys when they came out to recruit me. You know, I got a chance to come see the campus, and I knew I wanted to uh, – to come to a school like this. Now, you were the first guy to really change the trend here, to get the team into the NCAA tournament. What was it like being on a team that really was doing things that had never been done before? It was great. I mean, whenever you the beginning of something and you started the process here, it was just a great feeling. Now, I remember in that 2000 NCAA tournament, you played Oklahoma State, who had Desmond Mason, who has been in the NBA for a very, very long time. Yeah, hey, we what, actually played together in Oklahoma City. You played together in yeah. Oklahoma City, okay. I have always thought that for a mid-major team to win a game in the NCAA tournament, it's very difficult to do it when you're playing against a team like an Oklahoma State that's been around together. Did you find that to be the case? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, that game we came out with jitters, and, you know, they got off to a substantial lead. And I think once that, once after the first 10 minutes of the game, we played them pretty much evenly, but we was so much out of the game in the first 10 minutes, it was, it was kind of hard to we, we, we come back from that. Speedy Claxton joining John Rothstein here on 1050 ESPN New York as we are live at Hofstra University. Speedy's got a lot of NBA stories I'm sure that he'll fill us in on. As far as this place goes, when you think of Hofstra, what place does it have in your heart? Is this home? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, even though I, I live so many other places, I still came back to make this home. Yeah. So now, as far as Coach Wright going down to Villanova, have you become a Villanova fan? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they they're secondary to Hofstra, but you know, I, I rooted for them to go into the Final Four last year. Now, I want to get into your NBA career a little bit right now. You had a lot of different stops, but the one thing that always intrigued me when I talked to NBA players is talking about point guards that played for Larry Brown. And I know you had that luxury for a little while. Oh, day yeah. in, day out, what was it like to play for this guy? It was crazy. I mean, he'll tell you one thing one day, and he'll start doing that. Then a couple of days later, he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, you told me to do that. He's like, no, you got to do it this way. So it, it was hard. He's definitely hard on his point guards. Uh, but you just got to just gotta kind of tune him out a little bit. You got to listen to what he say, but tune him out a little bit, and you'll be fine. Now, when you left him, did you feel when you looked back and reflected on how Coach Brown really made me a better player? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, he, he was the first coach I had in the NBA. I'm, I'm very thankful. I mean, there they are a lot of coaches, good coaches in the NBA, but not like him. Now, Coach Brown was also involved in coaching Allen Iverson while you were in Philadelphia. That dynamic has been the center of a lot of attention in a lot of different <laughs> places. What was it like sometimes when they would go at it in practice? Did you almost want to just have a bucket of popcorn and sit there? 
it was eye opening. Yeah. <laughs> the stuff that they used to say to each other. Uh, but you know, they 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 definitely had a love hate relationship. A lot of uh, mutual respect. Oh yeah, definitely. A lot of a lot of respect. And I think uh, when AI was there, he he didn't know what he had in Larry Brown, and he really only realized once he once he wasn't there anymore. Now you played in Philadelphia for a couple seasons, and we talked about how difficult Larry Brown was on his point guards. How hard was he on Iverson? Uh, he actually wasn't that hard on him because he'll 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 yell at me through him for right, him. Right, exactly. <laughs> so. Uh, AI yeah, kind of knew when he was yelling at me. It was kind of it was for him. So I mean, I, I, that's how he treated him. Speedy Claxton, the great Hofstra guard, joining John Rothstein here on 1050 ESPN New York as we get you set for college basketball really coming to the forefront now. The next couple of weeks across the country. So you leave Philadelphia, you go to San Antonio to back up Tony Parker. You win a championship with the Spurs, playing with Tim Duncan, day in day out. By far, probably everybody talks about how great a professional he is. Was he? Oh yeah, Tim. Yeah, Tim's the best. Uh, if you're if you're around him, you won't even know that he's a superstar. Uh, he's so he's so much that down to earth. Uh, he'll invite you over to his house. I mean, big, when I was in San Antonio, that that team was very family oriented. Like mm -hmm. we, we would go to the movies together, bowling alley. Uh, we we'll all go to the movies, so it was fun. I mean, and uh, he's the leader of the team, and he 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 was the one who put all that together. Backing up Tony Parker, probably the highlight of your career as you went to the finals and won a championship that year. Popovich, though, a lot like Larry Brown. The he's almost it's, a disciple yeah. of Larry Brown. Was it almost like reliving the same situation? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I got to play for arguably the two best coaches uh, to ever coach the game. Uh, and I, I think Larry Brown liked me so much that he, he kind of sent me to Pop. So mm -hmm. he, he, he knew that my career was still going on a, a good path. All the places that you played in the NBA, what was the worst fit for you? The worst fit? Yeah. I'd probably say my first year in New Orleans. New Orleans. Yeah. What was wrong about that situation? Uh, well, I was having a great season when I was in Golden State. I right. was averaging like 15.7 assists. Right. Uh, then came the trade deadline, which was a couple of days ago. Is that with Barron? Yeah. Yeah, it was a trade. Yeah. yeah. And I got traded. Over there. And at that point, they only won like eight, nine games. So it was, it was kind of tough. Uh, now, you're in a situation where you're playing well. You're living in Golden State, which San Francisco is a great basketball city. Yeah. People, I don't think people understand what a nice, great NBA yeah. city it is. It definitely is. And then your cell phone rings one day, and I, I guess it was Chris Mullen who probably called you, mm -hmm. and said you traded. What is that like emotionally to go through that? Uh, that's, it's, a, it's tough. I mean – Whenever you get traded, it's tough. But even, like, during the middle of the season, it's even tougher. Uh, I mean, especially when, like, myself was having, like, I was having a great year, you know, thought the team wanted me. Not to, not to say that they didn't want me, but. They had a chance to get yeah, Baron they, Davis. They, they had a chance to get a bigger name player, so they had to do what they had to do. But it's, it's definitely discouraging. But you just got to move on. Now, I hear what you're saying. Now, one other stop that I think has a lot of intrigue for New York fans was the time you spent in Atlanta because Joe Johnson's a guy who they have on their list as one of the potential free agents that they can woo next summer. Joe Johnson first as a guy. What's he like? Great guy. Great guy. Great teammate. A uh, little quiet when you first get to, when you first meet him, but good guy. Would he relish the opportunity to play in New York? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, this is the, the mecca. Who, who wouldn't? I mean, I think if, they, if the Knicks are fortunate to get him, that they, they'll be getting a great player. Now, you see his situation in Atlanta versus New York. The team's been getting better every single year. I think they have a chance yeah. to make the conference finals. Wouldn't that be tough to leave, though, especially if he's a guy with a southern background and the team's getting better and they can pay him more than anybody else? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely hard to, to leave, but it's, there's, no, there's no place like playing in New York. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be tempting for him. No, I, def I definitely hear what you're saying. Speedy Claxton, the former Hofstra great guard, joining John Rothstein here on 1050 ESPN New York. You done playing? What's your goals now? What are you feeling? Yeah, I'm done playing. I mean, you know, my knee's not doing not, my knee's not doing too well, so I'm kind of forced to stop. Okay, and as far as this Hofstra team, I'm sure you've got a glimpse of their star guard, Charles Jenkins. What's your first impressions of Charles? A good, strong guard. Uh, he, he got another year of eligibility left, and I, I, see, I definitely see some great things in the future for him. Does he remind you of anybody? I mean, I know he's a little bit bulkier than you are, but is there a guard that he most resembles to you? 
I was, I was, I'd probably say BD, Baron Davis. Yeah. Uh, he's one, he's, Baron, Baron's the same, you know, physical specimen like Charles. Okay, now in terms of, I'm sure you watched a lot of college basketball this year. Who stands out to you right now as a team to watch in the tournament? Who do you like? Uh, I like Kentucky. I mean, it's, it's not, it, I think it's an obvious choice, but I like Kentucky. I like the way they play. I think John Wall is going to be a special, special player. You see any of yourself in Eric Bledsoe? Yeah. Like I was thinking yeah. that, yeah. He's kind of underrated, kind of under the the radar. Big time Jets, though. Oh, yeah. I like I like him, too. But, like, a lot, he don't get a lot of credit because, you know, they got Wall and Cousins and all them guys. But he's, he's a good player. All right. You get down to Villanova at all to see Coach Wright or what? Uh, last time I seen him was uh, this summer. He had a couple of work. He had a workout, actually, for his pro, what they call his pro day. Mm -hmm. You know, he had a lot of his pros backs. And he asked me to come down and participate in that. So I went down there. All right. Well, Speedy, great to see you. Good to have you back at Hofstra, and I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, man. All right. Speedy Claxton, former Hofstra great and NBA star, joining John Rothstein on 1050 ESPN New York. We will put a bow of this on this one when we return. John Rothstein, I'll be back tonight as well at 10 o'clock till midnight right here on 1050 ESPN New York. Okay, no way! It's me, Glenn, long-time listener! <laughs> hey, how you doing? Nah, come on, we're best buds. We need our own handshake, right? I'll go, and then bro hug into the bro bot. I am a bro bot. And then boom, make it explode! Oh, my card. It's okay, it's okay. Don't worry, I can get it back, all right? What's your pin? Come on, seriously, what's your pin? The Michael K Show, a new year, a new start time. Weekdays at 2 p.m., 1050 ESPN, New York. All right. All right, back on the campus of Hofstra University in Hempstead, New York. John Rothstein here on 1050 ESPN New York. We're taking you up until 11. I want to remind everybody I will be back on 1050 tonight at 10 o'clock till midnight. A lot of Knicks trade stuff as well as some Tiger Woods reaction. But right now we're going to do something that we've done the last couple of stops on this college tour. We're going to bring in a student to have a little Q&A and uh, a familiar face, a very up-and-comer in the business, Mike Leslie, Hofstra student. <laughs> Mike, good to see you. Thanks, John. Good to see you as well. Good. So uh, what's the word, man, right now? The floor is yours. What do you want to know? You're, the ball is in your court. Well, I, I mean, I think everybody here on campus is uh, obviously interested in tomorrow's game against Ryder, obviously an important game for this team. But I think a lot of people look at this Hofstra team and, and want to look at next season. Obviously, this season there's still a, a, a team that's won six of the last seven games. Right. They're playing well down the stretch, and there's certainly an opportunity for this team going into the conference tournament with how well they're playing. But with Charles Jenkins back next year as a senior, with Chaz Williams as a, as a sophomore as well as Candace Sevek, what do you think this team can be next year in terms of what they can do in the conference? Well, I think the bottom line at the end of the day is Hofstra has proven that they're a perennial team in the CAA. They're right. a perennial team. But college basketball, more than any other sport, comes down to possessions at the end of the game. So I think you have to always play your best when it matters most. Hofstra had a chance, like Coach Pecora said, against Connecticut and St. John's. Had they made more plays down the stretch, they'd have a different team. Now let's, let's flip this up a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about the Tiger Woods thing. He's going to be on the air in about 10 minutes. Just after we go off the air, he'll be on the air basically uh, on 1050 as well as everywhere else talking about his last three months. What do you make of this whole situation, and, and what does he need to do to kind of reestablish his former identity. I think we're funny in the media and in society that sometimes when a very public figure gets into a circumstance that a lot of people get into across the world, mm -hmm. we kind of put it on a different pedestal for the time that it happens, for the day that it happens. But when push comes to shove, by Sunday, I don't think people will be talking about this. I think it will have dissipated because he's a person just like everybody else. Plays golf probably better than everybody else, but he's a person just like everybody else. And at right. the end of the day, he's going to deal with his own problems internally, and it's his life. It's really not our business. I was going to say, is it, is it any of our business what it, goes it, on with him behind it, the scenes? It's not our business at all. It's not our business at all. It's his life. We, everybody seems to have forgotten what happened with Kobe Bryant four yeah. or five years ago. That went away very quickly. He reestablished himself, his identity, and now he's 
got his own puppet. Probably more likable now than he was before that. Probably. Yeah. Do you see the same type of thing possible for Tiger? And if so, how, quick, how quickly does it happen? I just think time heals everything. Time really responds because you're going to see another situation where somebody else is in the limelight for the wrong reasons. Probably in the next six months. I don't know about the Probably. caliber of a Tiger Woods, but you're going to see somebody step to the forefront. And to be coy and or to be candid, I should say, you know, by the middle of next week, this won't be a big story. And we'll find out if Hofstra can be Ryder if the Pride basketball team is. <laughs> <laughs> now, if he does, he, he announces today whatever he's going to announce. Uh, nobody really seems to know truly what, it's, what he's going to say. There was a, an article that, or something with the AP that came out with Tim Fincham saying that he's going to go back into rehab what, uh, and whatnot. When he does come back, whenever that may be, whether people it's... People will root. People. Sure, sure, people will root for him, but when is that going? I mean, does, does he... I don't think it would be smart for him to come back, let's say, at the Masters. He's got to come back sometime before Yeah, I think that, he'll correct? ease his way in, but people, people will rule. But this isn't about me. This is about you. I want to ask you now, what do you want to do? I want to do something along these lines. Obviously, I'm probably not going to be able to start here in New York. That doesn't happen very often for a 23-year-old kid. My idea is probably to go, whether it's back home, which is for me, upstate New York, around Albany, or quite frankly, anywhere else. Anywhere I can find myself with a microphone or a camera or somewhere, something along those lines. I'll go just about wherever. Do you want to do play-by-play? Do you want to do talk? I would do it pretty much anything. If I can get an opportunity to be on the air doing something, whether it's play-by-play, whether it's talk show, uh, whether I'm an evening sports anchor for some news channel, it really doesn't matter. If, I'm, if I get a chance to be on the air wherever it is, uh, I'll jump at the well, chance. Well, I can tell you, man, I've been around you for a while now. You make a great impression. You're going to have a great future in this business. I, some you. people you just can tell. He, he's definitely a guy I can tell. That's our good buddy Mike Leslie, one of the best interns we've had at 10.50. We're going to talk to him in a second at this Q&A afterwards. Very good. John Rothstein back to put a bow on this one when we return. One place. That's 10.50 ESPN New York. And New York coming to you live from Hofstra University at the Student Center here. Remember that today's broadcast is all brought to you by Muscle Milk. Build lean muscle, become a better bowler. Visit the site www.musclemilk.com to learn how the healthy proteins in muscle milk can help take your game to the next level. Just want to thank everybody here at Hofstra for having us. This was a lot of fun. We're going to do a little Q&A with some of the students after this show. And I want to thank... Coach Tom Pacor for popping on. Hofstra has a big game tomorrow against Ryder, and the Pride are playing better, as well as Speedy Claxton coming aboard here. And just some final thoughts right now. A lot of times in sports, you don't have one thing that can take over a country, one thing, one event that can really separate itself from everything else in sports. And I think we're on the horizon of that. And I'm not talking about what's going on with Tiger Woods, but I am talking about the NCAA tournament. Because it's February 19th, you got about another two weeks, three weeks before Selection Sunday and Conference Tournament, and just sit back and enjoy the next seven weeks because you're going through a situation right now that you're never going to have in any other sport. Sure, there's going to be postseasons, there's going to be playoffs, there's going to be drama, there's going to be talk shows filled with certain things, but you never have a real-life reality television series unfold right in front of you. And the biggest difference I see this year versus any other year is that there really are no great teams. There are teams with certain great personnel. There are teams with certain players that make you a little bit in a direction that you want to lean, but you never, ever believe that there's one team this year that can stand out and do it. I want to remind everybody I'll be back again on 1050 tonight from 10 to midnight talking Knicks. John Andres, Knicks radio analyst, coming up at 1025. Frank Isol of the Daily News coming up at 1110. Live from Hofstra, this has been John Rothstein on 1050 ESPN New York. Go Pride!